I was reading a lot about you today. Yeah, and, were you? And two things really stuck out for me. And and I have to say, one was Diana Ross, but but the other one was Al Pacino. All right. And like Carlito's Way is probably one of my favorite movies. All right, right. And I never realized it was you. And actually on the album. <laughs> When I went and grabbed it, you're the first track on it as well. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> like, and you didn't you have a weird meeting with Pacino somewhere? I did, I did. Uh, what was so strange was um, I was due to fly out to New York and perform at the, the premiere for Carlito's Way. And I used to work as a singer in this... Um, Italian restaurant called Villa de Cesare. And so by this point, my career started taking off. So I wasn't working there anymore. And some of my friends said, uh, let's go for a meal. And I thought, oh, let's go to Villa de Cesare because I still know the owner. He likes me and he'll give us a discount on the food. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was a really nice upmarket uh, posh Italian restaurant. It's, it's no longer there, but it was in central London. So me and my friends all went there. And lo and behold, who was there? Al Pacino. I think let's say it was like a Saturday or Sunday night. And I was due to fly out on the Sunday or the Monday to go and perform in New York on the Wednesday at the premiere. And I saw Al Pacino at this Italian restaurant and I, I struck up the nerve to go up to him and introduce myself. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get kicked away and, you know, let me, let, let me just go and try it. So I went up to him. And I said, hello, Mr. Pacino, my name is Rosella. Um, you don't know me, but I sung I Love Music for Carlito's Way. And I recorded it with Jelly Bean Benitez in New York. And I'll be performing at the premiere on Wednesday at, I can't remember the name of the theater, but I mentioned the theater that was being held at. And he looked at me and thought, she's got this inside information. She can't, <laughs> <laughs> she can't be lying. She's got like too much inside information. So like Jelly Bean Benitez, the, the theater I'll be performing at and all this and that, I had it all, you know, and he's like, hey, everybody, it was about 14 other people. This is Rosella. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be performing at the premiere. And uh, he gave me a hug. And the next thing he says, let's have a dance. I thought, wow. So we went and have a dance. And I must tell you, he was spinning me around and I thought he was <laughs> the strongest man ever i was prepared to go flying across the room but do you remember yeah. what the song was no the, the song that we danced to i cannot remember for the life of me and the, the the thing is at the time there wasn't iphones so i do not have a picture of al pacino and myself till today. <laughs> no way. I, I feel sick Paul. and then of course when, <laughs> when, when i flew to new york to perform at the premiere um, I told, you know, I to Sony at the time, I told him what happened. They took me after my performance to Al Pacino and I went, Mr. Pacino, hi, remember we met on Sunday? We had a dance event. Of course I do, Rosella. And there were all these paparazzi <laughs> taking pictures away. So <laughs> till today, Paul, I go onto the internet to just check Rosella photo with Al Pacino. Nothing. Oh, Nothing. I, it's in your head though it's, that, it's in that, my head sometimes they're better <laughs> exactly exactly but you know that's my story yeah it's it's funny how the like you literally can't do anything these days without someone taking a picture of you yeah yeah and, um and and so with with um diana ross it sounds as if she was actually um a bit of a diva well, I tell you what, you know, I, I obviously I supported Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you about that sort of later. <laughs> and of course, that's that's how I got to meet Dinah Ross. Uh, she came to one of his shows. It was in Norway, and um, I just come off stage, 
And then the box we were sitting in to watch Michael literally next door was Diana Ross, you know, and I grew up being such a fan of this woman. I mean, I still am in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I recognize her with, you know, she had really long hair then, the really long, thick black hair, beautiful. Yeah. And um, I just come off stage and I was with my dancers and we said hi to her. And she recognized us because we just come off stage. I went, hi, Miss Ross. We were just on stage. She went, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You know, fantastic. And then the dancers, you know, we asked, do you mind if we have a picture with you? Absolutely no problem. Just make it quick because Michael's coming on just now. You know, she's really nice. <laughs> so so uh, we took pictures with her. I've got a picture with her and myself. And literally, literally the next day, I was at the airport um, yeah. in departures. And I think I was in in a chemist or, yeah, it was a chemist or some makeup shop or something. Uh, and on the aisle, Diana Ross was walking, you know, and I recognized them. Like, I just saw her yesterday. Imagine what luck to meet her the very next day. And, you know, she carried on walking and then uh, she looked at me and I went, hi, Miss Ross. Remember we met yesterday, Rosella? I supported Michael Jackson. She completely blanked me. <laughs> completely blanked me. And, and to make matters worse, I had my hand sort of like ready for a handshake. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I was so frozen in shock. I kept on following her with my hand like that. <laughs> hoping I'd get a handshake. Oh, that is so and good. she literally just, and then I carried on, you know, because I was so shocked. I went, you're going back to America. She turned around. She went, yes. And she went, and then she just walked off. <laughs> oh. So that was my experience with Miss Ross. And then it's funny. After that, um, I started hearing more stories about how her diva temperament could be. Yeah. I th I think famously in airports. Yeah, I, I never knew that. <laughs> I, I never knew that. And then it's just funny. It, it, I read after that um, uh, she slapped an air stewardess for trying to comfort one of her crying yeah. sons. Those are one of the stories I've heard. So I'm like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Maybe she's just a very nervous fly. Eh? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or maybe just a very nervous handshaker person. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but when, so, when you think of their music, though, like growing up, it was something that I heard yeah. like a lot in, in even in my house, and yeah. um, it it must have been similar for you because um, I think from a very young age, you obviously it's in your DNA, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. come on, it's in your DNA, and um. Like from a very young age, you were recognized as like a a standout singer, um, and you you grew up in Zambia. Yeah. Like your younger years, and then you yes. moved to about ten. Yes. You were about ten or eleven when you moved to Zimbabwe. I was about uh, fourteen, fifteen when yeah, I moved to Zimbabwe. Playing underage, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm telling you my true age just now. Let's not get there. <laughs> And um, but like one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to touch on was that from from reading about you, like what the thing that really stands out is how hard you worked at everything. Yeah. And like, I think I think sometimes people are quite fortunate. Yeah. But it sounds from reading your story it it really sounds as if like you worked hard were 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 signed by like was it atlantic or artista i can't remember but one of the big labels sony sony and, no and then they they oh and then oh, it, yeah it was it was a uh, pulse eight an independent label called pulse eight but you kept you kept sending tapes and yes doing all the proper stuff and rehearsing and gigging and and I think like like on SLE radio we try and support independent artists and would would try and we're not ageist at all. <laughs> I wouldn't be in the show for her. <laughs> and um and I think one of the things that really st struck me was how hard you. You had to work at everything. Yeah. 
and even though you had like like quite early on you won like a massive competition yes and but you still kept it wasn't like oh here i am so yeah. it, like, you did the hard work yeah and and yeah. like what does that involve Uzala, for f- what did it involve like back in the day do you know paul i think what's kept me going uh as far as working hard and it was hard work but i never even till today I'd, i've never seen it as hard work yes it can be hard of course it can sometimes be frustrating and a very fickle industry but um, what has kept me going is my passion to yeah. be a performer, to sing. And the fact that nearly so many years later, I'm still getting bookings to perform at clubs, at festivals, at private dues. And I just think to myself, well, somebody out there still wants me. You yeah, know? yeah, a lot of people still <laughs> want to <your> be <laughs> <laughs> that voice. Uh, and 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 that encourage that encourages me and of course uh the audience reaction you know i would say 99.9% of the times is phenomenal that keeps me going yeah that keeps me going and i think well it's worth it let me just keep throwing mud and wherever it sticks <laughs> i'm going to go for it for as long as i feel as passionate I love performing. I love singing. I, I don't know what else in the world I would do. So here I am. And if you want me to come and sing for you, Paul, I'll come. <laughs> yeah, well, you can come over to Jersey anytime. <laughs> um, the, if it's okay, can, can, we, can we talk about, like, sort of from 1988, like going, going right up to sort of when everybody's free was released yeah and obviously like at the start it 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 was massive in clubs yeah but it it didn't hit the charts a little while later that'd be far enough to say wouldn't it yeah yeah i mean um i traveled i started traveling to the united kingdom late 1988 i started working uh in a, a friend's recording studio, sending round cassettes, trying to get a deal. So that happened late 1998 into 1989. And then 1990, uh, I spent the longest time in the UK and uh, still sending round cassettes. And I'm hoping, you know, please God, let yeah. something stick. And then uh, it fell on the laps of uh, the band of gypsies, uh, one of these cassettes, and they got in touch with me. They loved my voice. And uh, I, I met them and we talked about what style of music I want to do. Um, and, you know, I said I wanted to do dance music that was uplifting, lyrics that were positively charged. And therefore, the whole album of Everybody's Free, if you listen to it, the lyrics are really positive. You know, I'm, yeah. I mean, the title yeah. track itself, Everybody's Free to Feel Good. You know, if you listen to the verses and the chorus, it speaks to humanity all, o- all over the world, whatever... Yeah you might be going through whoever you are, whatever your race is for everyone. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can relate to it. And I grew up in, in Belfast, like during the troubles and, right. And, um, and like, I can remember going to clubs and then your song coming on and like people <laughs> just go mental. And, but it, that's the one thing about music it it because belfast was a deeply divided city right right but young people just were sick of it and they didn't want it anymore right. and of course we went to clubs and like my sort of things punk and indie and and whatever but i still went to dance clubs yeah yeah and like <laughs> it's there's something special about the drum and bass, you know, yeah, and especially yeah. in that song, it's it's wonderful. It's a it's truly wonderful because I hadn't listened to it for a while, and <laughs> I was bopping about this morning, <laughs> and and it we were free, absolutely, and like the three minutes or whatever when I put it on this morning, even then, yeah. Like, the memories were beautiful. Yeah. Like I was just thinking about having a laugh and yeah. 
it speaks to you. It, yeah. it brings out, uh, you know, positive, good emotions, you yeah. know, and if, and if you've been through any negative emotions, it's a song that brings you out of it, hopefully uh, into the light. So, yeah, speak. No, so that, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think one, one really maybe unexpected thing, but a, a big thing that came out of it was, I think with, with like the gay community. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, people were inspired by the song and they yeah. were able to like speak about like their sexuality. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, I have to give a shout out to the gay community. They are my biggest fans, you know, and I've had gay friends or gay fans that have come up to me and have said, you know, they were so afraid of coming out and saying who they were, what they were. And some of them have said, you know, um, your song gave me the strength to tell mom and dad I'm gay. Yeah. I'm free to be gay. I've had some men who have said, we married our wives and we told our wives, honey, I'm gay. I can tell you that I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you every happiness, but this is who I am. And I've had people who have, um, you know, loved the song so much that I've had, uh, you know, stories where I've been told uh, a loved one has passed away. And they've loved the song so much and it was played at their wake. You know, yeah. so so everybody's free has it speaks so many different volumes to everybody, to everyone. Yeah, no, it's and and it must have been it must have been crazy for you. <laughs> like when you appeared on to, top of the pops for me was like the measure of an artist. When yeah. you were on there, you'd you'd made it, you were yeah. a billionaire. Yeah. You know, not in terms of money, but like in terms oh, of Oh, believe me, as when I was on top of the pops, I thought, yeah, I'm made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For me, that was a big one. And I remember, you know, I, I had um, the opportunity of appearing top on top of the pops with different various tracks eight times. Yeah, like yeah. you did top 20s. <laughs> you know, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> not bad at all. And I used to be told, you know, when you uh, go on top of the pops and you've got a hits, a, a a track in the in the charts it goes up a few more notches and and each time I appeared on top of the pops that happened all the time yeah. so like I started getting greedy and thinking I need to be on top of the pops every <laughs> week <laughs> I was it's just wonderful memories wonderful because I think I think like kind of what I've not what I forgot but it was a it was a very different song at the time when it came yeah. out yeah and then, like, quite a few people kind of started doing the same drum and bassy kind of thing. I know it existed, like, underground kind of before that. But you were part of that scene because you were doing it. <laughs> and, um, like, even your most recent song, I Want You Back. Yeah. I, I listened to all the remixes. All right. And... Like if anyone hasn't got it, they need to get it on the local <laughs> the streaming <laughs> service or whatever. On and, thank um, you, Paul. <laughs> but the, they're really different. Yeah. Like yeah, I'm thinking this is just five remixes, but every yeah. single one of them is really different. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Project K is is so out there. It's, it's yeah. It's really good. Yeah. The Pretzel one's brilliant. Project K. What, what about the, 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 the Doganov? The Doganov, I think. The, the Doganov. I love brilliant. that. One. That's my mix. I love I, that. I really like the Frank Blythe as well. Oh, the Frank Blythe is just, um, that's very, very soulful. Yeah. You know what? I think there's a, the sax, sax playing in there as well. And, yeah, it's um, like sultry. That, that one. Oh, oh that, that is, yeah. Now I'm going to listen to this track after I finish speaking <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to, I I need to reacquaint phone. myself with that song. <laughs> yeah, that as a recording artist, when like when you're recording, how do you do it? Because I read about like you sung the chorus over and over for everybody free, and yeah. and and that's another thing that. It's not just like throw down the first thing that sounds yeah, half oh decent. No, 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 no. Like, are you a bit of a perfectionist, Rosala? Um, you know, when I go into the studio, Paul, I want to get it over and done with. 
<laughs> I don't want to waste time because singing a song over and over for me as a vocalist, the voice gets tired. You know, so yeah. usually what I do beforehand, I learn the song uh, that I know when I'm in the studio, I know the song 98%. And, and when I'm in the studio, I bring my personality to it. So if you want, I bring Rosella to it. Yeah. And uh, I'll warm up. And I normally do about five or six takes. And somewhere in those five or six takes, there's a really good take, maybe one or two good takes throughout. And if there's any bum notes in that one or two takes, then they'll just drop little bits and pieces from the other four or five other takes. Yeah. But normally I, I do a take right through and get it as, as perfectly as I possibly humanly can. Um, yeah. yeah. And th that's how I work. And, and honestly, if I'm still singing the seventh or eighth time in a take, then I'm, my voice is tired. I, I can't do it. Yeah. And, and I, I read somewhere else that, that, um, that producers sort of would often have an idea, but you would just bring your own, <laughs> like, and you don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, <laughs> I, I think you might be a bit of a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> well no I, I you know I listen to their views and uh, you know I think everybody everybody's got a, a shared vested interest in um, in the studio and I at the moment I'm, I'm working on, an, on my my new album and I've got uh, the, the producer uh, Paul who, who does more of the mixing and gives me a nice mix uh, in my ears yeah. and then I have Gary and Nikki French who's a, a brilliant singer um, and I trust their judgment and they will tell me, yeah. Rosella, you sung a bum note there or Rosella, you didn't hit that note, you know, uh, and Nick has done quite a few backing vocals on, on a few of the songs on the album I have coming out. So I trust their judgment because yeah. I can sometimes be so overcritical of my voice and what I'm hearing that I'm, I'm thinking I haven't done it. And when I come out, Gary, Paul and, and Nikki will play the tracks through and I go, we think you really sung that well. We think yeah. we, should, we should leave that. And I'm going, are you sure? Are you sure? Because I'm so critical of myself. I could just like want to go in the next day and keep singing the same song over and over yeah. and without realizing you've got to stop somewhere and just appreciate that you got the, the take here or there. But um, yeah, we all, I, I, I trust the judgment so much. And uh, yeah, it's been good doing this album with them. Yeah. And um, it, it does good. Because you've, we've all seen technology change like a lot. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. In the last, here we are on Zoom, and um, and I'm not, I'm still not convinced that digital sounds is good. The what sounds? Uh, like the digital, so your oh, iTunes right, or right, Spotify right. or whatever. Right. I'm not, I'm not convinced it sounds as good as a record. All right. Okay. And um, and of course. Back in the day, like our D I'm sure DJs don't mind it now. They were lugging around boxes of <laughs> records. <laughs> right. And of course, I had people like you sing live as well. Yeah. And like going back to the, the whole work ethic thing, like typically how many nights or how many times a day were you singing at, at one stage? It seems oh my as God. if you were doing like about 10 gigs a day. Oh my God. I remember there was, there was, um, I was promoting everybody's free and faith and are you ready to fly? And uh, I did seven club dates in one day. My goodness. Seven, and we started, we started earlier on in the day at the teen nightclubs. And remember I was promoting these singles, you know, and then we also had to work in the travel logistics from one place to the next and make sure I wasn't rushed or this and that. When we got to the, the, the we started in the afternoon and we finished by 4.30 the next morning. And I remember I was so tired one of the nightclubs and I got there early. I needed to sleep and I slept for about 20. I had a nap for about 20, <laughs> <laughs> I had a nap for about 20 minutes somewhere in the corner of the club whilst this music was boom, boom, boom. Uh -uh. I couldn't care less. I couldn't hear it. I was so tired. <laughs> but I did it and I, I did the graft and, you know, I think it's paid off. Yeah, and and like it, I talk I talked to quite a lot of punk guys, and one of my favorite bands they're they're based in South Bay in California. Yeah, 
and like at their peak, they were only gigging like five. It's a lot, five times a week. Wow. But <laughs> you were doing that in a day. <laughs> I was doing that in a day. Bloody hell. I was doing that in a day. Yeah. And um, I have, I have to go back to Carlito's way again. But do you know, do you know, I love music features in it three times. Does it? Three separate times. Yeah. How do I not know that? Yeah. I only, it, oh, my gosh. It's in the scene where I'm trying to remember where the third one is, but it's in the scene where they're having a party at, um, what's his name? Kleinfeld's like sort of beach house type thing. That's where I is. can see it. That's so it's where in I can that, hear it. and then the by the club, and it's in the club, and it's it's in for a third time, and I'll oh I'll find my. out where. Well, where now I'm is. going to I'm going to re-listen to I want you back, and I'm going to re-watch <laughs> Kalito's way. <laughs> yeah, I must have seen it about hundred times. <laughs> it's a great movie, isn't it? Oh, I love Pacino. Great I love movie. him even more Brilliant. now that he that he danced here as well. You uh, danced with me, and I just feel oh, I don't have a picture, and I. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, is one of life's living greatest actors. And and you danced with him as well, to be fair. I danced yeah, with him. Yeah, he was like spinning so. me around that floor. I was waiting to, to, to be flown off because he was so strong and he was spinning me around and oh, amazing, and magical. It's just cool, isn't it, when, when that happens? Honestly. Like, somehow the stars align and it's, it's lovely. It's, honestly, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm one of those people, Paul, I mean... I never knew that would happen, you know, but I'm one of those people that always thinks, you know, what you put out there, you get back. Life is like a mirror. You know, you put yeah. out bad stuff, you'll get bad stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and I've always been that kind of person, you know, be aware as much as you can as to what you put out there in life, what you wish for yourself in your life, because it comes. But, but what about boat word? Because I read an interesting thing when when you were on the the Jackson tour, um, which was um, I wrote it down here. Um, what a lumac is it? I'm terrible, you know. <laughs> I, I I need to get more. What was the dangerous one? I couldn't remember the name of the tour. You need a secretary. I, I know that is just me. <laughs> and, um, and the Labrador, he helps out. <laughs> um, and I think during that during that period, either the sun or the news of the world published a, like a totally untrue story about you. Oh, like, yeah. And I think they said something like, uh, what was it, that, that you'd, you'd said something basically that you hadn't said at all? Yeah. Because like, yeah. I think it was just like, oh, I'll never see Michael Jackson. It wasn't yeah. even like anything bad at them, even if yeah. you did say it, which you didn't. Yeah. And I think the Jackson fans, like, really took... Oh, oh, <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you a story, actually, what happened. The Jackson tour had just kicked off, and the News of the World wrote this untrue article. And they didn't interview with me, but they chose the worst picture of all, like I had evil eyes. <laughs> 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 you know, so they chose that, and they said... Rosella said being on this tour with Michael is like two ships in the night. He's not allowed <laughs> me. Oh, oh my gosh. So I thought I was just waiting to be told you're fired. You know, and uh, I remember I went out. I just heard Michael likes toys. <laughs> so I went and bought him a teddy bear and a balloon. <laughs> and I wrote a card saying, I'm so sorry, um, Mr. Jackson. I did not say this and blah, blah, blah. And I, I gave it to his management, who are really nice to me. And he sent a message back saying, please tell Rosella not to worry. I'm so used to these uh, tabloids spinning untruths. Yeah. Anyhow, it went on to his fans. There were, I remember five, well, there were five fans. And um, they were writing mean things about me on my tour bus that before I left the hotel, fortunately, my dancers would rub it off before I could see it, but just really awful. And when I'd come on stage, these fans saved every penny they possibly could. And as soon as the stadium doors opened, they were right in front of the barriers, you know, being yeah. squashed by everyone else behind them, but they didn't care. And as soon as I came on stage, they'd be doing this to me, they'd be swearing <laughs> right. me. And I'm going, 
oh my gosh, but every, uh, everyone at uh, 75,000 other people were screaming and going, Rosella, and you know, but these four or five people were managing to get my attention and put me off. And uh, I told Michael security guards who were about six or five. And uh, the next day they're like, don't worry, Rosella, you just go back on that stage. We'll deal with it. So as soon as I got on stage, lo and behold, they started again. F you, <laughs> <laughs> And Michael security guards like, freaking Batman jumped off on either side of the stage and went straight to them. I don't know whatever they said to them because the next day when I went on stage, I looked at them, I went, hello. And I sort of kissed my ass and gave it to them. And they all went, <laughs> <laughs> they all put their heads down and they didn't utter a thing. Yeah. You know? So fast forward, which is interesting, fast forward many years later, I, I was doing a, a, a festival um, and some person came up to me. He says, I owe you an apology. I said, oh, oh, why? You know, he said, I was one of those horrible fans of Michael Jackson that was swearing you all because of that newspaper article. And now I see that it's, it was rubbish and mature. And I just want to profusely, profusely apologize for my behavior. There was two of them have since come up to me and have some way gotten in contact with me. That's to good. Profuse, yeah, to give their profuse apology. And uh, because it did affect me back then, it, it was scary. Oh, you know? yeah. It was scary. And then one of them was a female. I remember she was a female. I was, um, uh, I went to, uh, what, what are these music awards called in, in the Brit Awards? Uh, and I went with my husband and uh, we were at the after party at the Brit Awards. And one of these, uh michael jackson fans and i recognized that she was coming up to me she's like so you bitch you haven't had another hit single since michael jackson have you and i reckon <laughs> no just another seven <laughs> i know hello and i recognized and my heart started beating and she looked so mean and i recognized her as one of the fans that was she was she was the worst of all of them and uh my husband i said She's the one who was on me. And my husband just told her to fuck off and she left, <laughs> you know, but these two other fans of his uh, later went on to profusely apologize to me, which was very kind of them. And I asked them what happened to the girl. Cause she, they said she was the worst of the lot. She had Michael Jackson posters plastered from ceiling to you name it, that she lost it a bit. She went a bit loopy. No way. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't really sound as if she lost it. No, no, I think. Lost it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, my, 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 you know, my thing is, some of these fans get so lost in other artists' lives, they forget yeah. that at the end of the day, yeah, Michael Jackson is who he is. He's made it proud of him and all that. But there's another human being, just like you and I, at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but one that's made it big. That one that's got a talent, one that can sing and we're proud of him, we admire him, we love his music, we go crazy. But at the end of the day, he's another human being just like you, he's not God. So for this girl to have gone to that level of whatever. And, and Rosala, when you've been going around sort of Europe and all that, what have you found um, like any differences between the fans or are they all like special or like what's your favorite city? Let's let's start there. You know, Paul, I don't have any favorite city uh, because all the fans have been so amazing, have been so welcoming, in, welcoming, have been so they embrace me. Like a couple of years ago, I did about 12 or 15 I Love the 90s dates in Spain, across the whole of Spain. Yeah. And um they were held in stadiums. So it took me back to the Michael Jackson yeah, yeah. time when I did stadiums with him. Although the capacity wasn't 75,000, but we're talking anywhere between 10 to 20,000 people. And when I came on stage and did my thing, oh my gosh, the reaction was mind blowing. Yeah, you know, no, so, yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> so yeah, I'll go to those cities any day. And so all the fans have just been amazing. And, and it's them that keep me going.
I'll I'll name one because because you don't want to offend anyone. You're too nice. Oh, Barcelona is the best city in Europe, I think. Barcelona, Barcelona is beautiful. Or or Paris, maybe Paris. Well, you see, there you go. You see, you can't choose now, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm going back to Belfast next week, so everyone's <laughs> kill me. <laughs> Belfast, of course. Of course. <laughs> that goes course. without saying, though. <laughs> Not sure we'll have quite the romance of, of um, Paris or Barcelona. <laughs> I'm sure it does in some ways. I'm sure it does. But, but we've got the electricity and that's a lot. That's, exactly. That's always exactly. a good, good city. Um, so, so you have a new album coming out. And when should we expect it? Oh, well, Gary and I were just talking. I've got um, one more track left to record for the album. I've got one more track to fix the vocals. There, you see, there's my yeah. professional <laughs> yeah. diva coming out. Where I need to fix this vocal because I like I, I can hear a bum note. <laughs> so I need to, I need to fix that and leave uh, do the one more track to record. So Gary and I thought uh, we're looking at about March 2022. <clears throat> St Patrick's Day, you could bring the same yeah, thing maybe, to March, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe St Patrick's Day, yeah, yeah, maybe. Oh, you know what? My birthday is on the 18th of March. <laughs> and say oh, on the 17th right yeah yeah so either one of those days will do me so um t- t- speaking of birthdays tell us a little bit about growing up in zambia uh it you know i my grandparents grew me up my mom uh, was very young when she had me so i have wonderful wonderful memories of growing up in zambia i was uh brought up in the second city which is indola on a yeah. farm with my grandparents and then, uh, you know, when my mom had uh, sorted herself out and everything when I was about 10 years old, she came to get me to live with her in the main city, Lusaka. And uh, from Lusaka, we moved to Zimbabwe when I was 13, 14, you know. So I spent my formative years in Zimbabwe as I, as I see it. And that's where I really started with my career. Although in Zambia, I was singing on children's television programs. I knew from there on, this is what I want to do. I want to yes. be a singer. From there on, I knew, you know, and and I, in fact, I remember when I was about 14, before we left Zambia, uh, my dad, bless his soul, he's not here with us anymore, believed in me. Oh, and he had a friend that was a band leader at the Hotel Intercontinental in Lusaka. And he, he said, look, my daughter can sing. Can you give her, you know? Um, a stint at one of your gigs and it's like yeah okay she can come and sing at uh, <laughs> Hotel Intercontinental uh, for two weeks every night you bring her and she can just do you know four songs with the band whilst people are having their dinner but they couldn't advertise me because I was underage <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant so that was my first sort of live to adult sort of entering of the world of performance and, and what sort of songs were you singing back then well, because I, I was 14, I was only doing uh, four or five songs with band, you know, and then I would leave and go home and go to bed and get ready for school in the morning. Yeah. And then you moved the when you moved to Zimbabwe. Yeah. You were in a band. Were they called Grab? Yeah, yeah we were called Grab. And, and they were, <laughs> That's they a were great four, name. Yeah, they were. Well, That's the, a reason punk is, name. <laughs> the name, the name, the reason we got that name was it was from the the, the first letters of our names. So in the band there was oh. there was Gabby, uh, there was Boyki, or no, there was Gabby, Rosella, Andy, and Boyki. So we've got <laughs> the beginnings of the first letters of our names, and we called it Grab. Oh, that's brilliant! Yeah. And yeah. what sort of stuff were you were you playing in Grab? We were doing cover songs. That was, you know, Zimbabwe and Zambia are very, you know, the radio stations are very westernized as well as. They had their own African sound as well. So we did a mix of, of uh, majority Western music and threw in a few sort of African sounds as well. And we went around the country sort of as a cover band, really, doing uh, all this stuff. And and that's when I thought, I'm loving this, but I need to branch out and be my own artist and record original material under my own name. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then, and then like I was saying to you earlier, what you put out there, hopefully, you know, comes to be in a good way and... The next thing I knew, there was a talent contest. I joined it. I won the talent contest, and that resulted in uh, the prize being a, a record deal. Record, record yeah, record. and then that that life began for me. Yeah. You know, and then I'm thinking, okay, I've made it as big as I can in Zimbabwe. I need to go international. 
then the doors to England or America opened up for me and it was England and here we are. Yeah, and in America in particular, like I, I read a, a nice thing about you playing, a, I think it was a club in Miami. Yeah. And like just start, there wasn't any room in it at all. Yeah. But what was it I was reading that the whoever the like the hostess was, she was trying to bring you like room. It was crazy. And, and it do it. It stays in my head. For, it was it was a gay club, and it was. I mean, what happens? I find with gay clubs, a lot of straight people crash them. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, so so you end up thinking, is this a straight club? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it was a gay club, and there were a, a whole host of drag queens and all you know dressed up to the nines, looking beautiful. And um, and the 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 host was uh, the drag queen dressed up to the nines, and a big fan, big Rosala fan. And I remember walking into the reception area, and there was this massive. I mean, it was a massive vase of roses. I mean, it looked so <laughs> beautiful. So I was admiring this paint. Oh, that's lovely too big for anyone to carry you know but that was in the foyer where it belonged next thing I'm on stage performing and it's completely jam-packed I mean people could not move and at the distance I saw this massive flower pot moving <laughs> coming, to, <laughs> coming towards me <laughs> and I'm singing I'm going oh what's going on and as it got closer, this person couldn't carry this thing anymore because it was so heavy. And I'm going, those are the, the flowers from the foyer. Who's carrying this? That must be too heavy. And then security guards came and ran and helped this person with the, these flowers. And they were like, what are you doing? You're going to hurt yourself. She's like, I just want to give the flowers to Rosella. <laughs> <laughs> so that, oh. was, that, that, that has just sort of imprinted its, its memory in my head. It was so wonderful. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, it's so great. wonderful. That's a, it's just lovely, you know, when people are, and you must get that a lot where where people want to show you with gifts and whatever. Absolutely, and... it is lovely. And and Paul, it's like I say, you know, it's just uh, you know, I did a gig um on Saturday in Birmingham. Uh, I love the nineties. It was called, and there must have been about two thousand, two and a half thousand people in there. A they were probably born when everybody's free was released or long after. <laughs> Seriously, I could be, I could now be their grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> but they you don't were look singing, like you could. <laughs> they were singing lyric after lyric when I came on stage. And, you know, the screams and, and the applause and the look on their faces just filled me with such love and humility. And I think yeah. to myself, when I get off stage, you know, my husband was watching with a smile on his face from the corner of the stage. And he's like, that's why you do it, isn't it? Because look at look at the response and reaction you get. Yeah. Uh, it's so lovely. And it and that's what keeps me going. I, lo I love the f the f what you said there about being humble with it. And I think Absolutely. you are genuinely, I think. Thank you. I think from reading, like, you're a hard worker, you're humble, but you have like deep down inner belief like i know you probably don't need it so much now but when you were 14 <laughs> and or 15 and grab <laughs> with the rest of them you recognize that i want to do my own stuff yeah and, that, and that's big yeah because that's a nice little gig with your friends absolutely covers and having a good time and yeah and, but it's it's lovely that when when people don't settle and chase their dreams, I think That's it's right. one of the best. That's right. Like to try it anyway, you know, and and it doesn't always work out. It, yeah, yeah, it doesn't always life. work out, and it, and it's tough, you know. But but it, but even when it doesn't, and I bet you, like through it all i bet you've had some really tough times oh gosh absolutely you know it, there's been a mix i mean i remember you know uh when i signed to sony and uh suddenly they dropped me from the label and i'm going but everything's going well and i've recorded such a great album with sony i mean one of the songs i did was with uh um He's, he's since passed away. I forget his name now. Um, 
oh gosh, I forgot his name. I, I did uh, with Di- Diane Warren, Frankie Knuckles. Oh you know? yeah. And I, I went to New York to work with Frankie Knuckles and what a beautiful soul, you know? So that was one of my dream albums, you know, that I did. Yeah. And, um, and then the girl bands and the boy bands during that period started breaking out and happening. And of course, they ruined things for me, you know? Sony dropped me from the label. I was lucky if I had one club date coming from seven club dates a day to do what if if I was lucky to get one club date in a period of two months. That's what happened. And I'm thinking maybe this is the end of my career. Yeah. You no. Know? It was just a maybe, high year. Maybe, thing, you know, I've had my time now and uh, and this is it. You know, there was no um warning, no nothing. And uh, it was a, a bit of an anxious period, but when I look back, that was also the time um, I met my husband. I wasn't traveling as much. So I look back now and I just think everything happens for a reason because then maybe yeah. the forces or God said, no, it's time for you to get into a relationship now and, and get to know each other because, you know, when you're in a relationship and you're traveling as much, you don't have the time to sustain it. And who knows where that could go. Yeah, and, no. and um, and another thing that came across, I've like I'm not going to ask you about it, but I, I think in a number of times, journalists and sort of radio hosts, whatever, the the vast you about, like number one being female, number two being from Zimbabwe and Z- Zambia and whatever, and not once did I read anything like negative that you said about the music industry yeah and that's class you're yeah, a class yeah. act you know thank you thank you so much because it would be thank because you. actually it's true like it is like i know it's true that the music is male centric white let's just say yeah and um do, do all the artists get a fair crack of the whip no they don't the yeah, and I, I'll say it, but but you have too much class to say something like Thank that. Thank you. I leave it to say, it, Paul. <laughs> it read my mind. <laughs> but but even now, for for young artists, I th- there's some of it I just don't get. Yeah. Like in in Britain, there there's an artist called Arlo Parks, who I'm sure have you heard Arlo Parks' no, and stuff. No, no, Arlo Parks. She's black. She's she's about twenty one, I think. And she won the Mercury Music Prize. All right, all right. And like the critical acclaim that she gets is it's always fantastic. Oh. Like it's always fantastic. But her sales never match up. Yeah. To, yeah. to, to like how good be. she is. If, right, right, right. And I just yeah. wonder that she gets the support from the label that she should yeah. and, and whatever. Yeah. And um. Yeah, th- th- that's enough about that. That's, that's just me <laughs> ranting. <laughs> well, you you see it, you see it. So, you know, and it, it's it's um like I'm conscious of the time, and I'm conscious how long I've had you, which seems like about two seconds. <laughs> but um, the you've got your album coming out soon. Yeah, got my album. So like out. March, hopefully by your birthday. Yes, Which yes, just nice. St. Peter's or St. Patrick's, sorry. Yeah, St. Patrick's, so. Yeah, and there. like people should definitely check out I Want You Back because Thank you. the remixes are all, they're so different. And like, we're, even you're going back to listen to I'm going Frank, back to Frank, listen, Frank, I swear. Frank, I want to listen to Frank Blythe and Doganov and like, you know, watch Carlito's way now as well. <laughs> yeah, but well, you can fast forward to the scene. I'm gonna fast forward. <laughs> like, what was Paul saying? Let me just check that out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll 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 say I'll send you a message let with, me know, with the timestamps on. Yeah, yeah, let me know. Yeah. Um, I might watch it myself tonight. Um, but it's been a, like I feel so honored to be able to talk Thank to you, you in Paul. person. And and the other thing is like it's it's amazing that the even be a minor hit in this kind of thing but the to have a have a song and the consistency of performances that you had yeah have and 
to, to get an absolute banger, you know, that that has, I think it has genuinely helped people and it's changed perhaps the way they've dealt with things. Yeah. And, and one of the things that it gives me, which I'm, and I can see it in you as well, is gratitude. Oh, yes. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm very grateful for, for people like you who release fantastic songs and, and you know what, you've never rested Thank on your you. laurels either because you've kept doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate that with every beat of my heart. Yeah, and yeah, again, it's you. people like you that also keep me going by everything you've said. You know, so I'm raring to go. And uh, so we might be here when I'm 80 years old, still like, hello, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be about the same age. <laughs> it's, exactly. it's fun. I've got to show you this, will you? I was looking at your press shot for the... Um, oh. And you haven't changed a bit, you know? <laughs> thank you. You haven't changed you know, a bit. Oh, oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. I, I can get in the way of my stresses and strains, but hey. My, my philosophy is, you know, life is long but short and just grab it by the horns and... Yeah. Oh, you've certainly it, done that. <laughs> live it to the best with wisdom. Honestly. Honestly. Yeah, yeah when you're catching a kip, when exactly. you're catching a sleep <laughs> in between 10 gigs <laughs> with bass booming at you, you're grabbing life by the horns, all right? <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Oh, oh, it's it's been an absolute joy. Thank yeah, you so same much. Here. Thanks a So million. we'll be speaking again in the near future, huh? Yeah, definitely. All right, my darling. All right. Well, let me wish you Merry Christmas anyway, because it's we get in there now. Merry yeah. Christmas and very best wishes for 2022. Yeah, Merry Christmas and very best Thank wishes you, to you as well. Thank you. Thanks a million, Rosal. Thank you, God bless. <laughs>